And welcome to the second part of the NFRC Quincy's Centennial Seminar Series. Uh, this three-part series honors and celebrates the 100th anniversary of NFRC Quincy this year. Um, before we begin, I just want to mention that this meeting is being recorded, just so that everyone's aware. Uh, my name is Kelly Thomas. I'll be your host for today. I have been a biological scientist at the station since 2018, and I'm currently also pursuing a master's degree in agroecology from the University of Florida. <clears throat> so our program today will cover the current capabilities and research and extension areas or priority areas of the present day NFREC Quincy. We will discuss how we use a systematic or team approach to face current challenges in agriculture and natural resources. Many of you have seen the mural at NFRC Quincy's lobby, a picture of which is on your screen. Uh, when the current building was built, a, a certain amount of the budget was allocated to purchasing artwork. And in 2001, the artist Eileen Winter Mostel was commissioned to create this piece for the center, which she titled Agriculture in Harmony with Nature. So many of us walk by this mural every single day, and it's a constant reminder of our missions and goals at the center. If you look closely at the piece, you'll see each NFRAC program represented in some fashion. As the name suggests, each NFRAC faculty and staff member strives to work together, bringing our own individual expertise rather than in competition with one, one another in order to complete our research and extension missions. So without further ado, let's get to our program for today. The format of the program will be a short presentation by our two speakers, Dr. Matthews Parrett and Dr. Cheryl Makoviak. We'll then take a short break for some trivia and then get to a Q&A um, session, at which point we'll bring in Dr. Gary Knox as our third panelist. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the program, please type them in the chat box and I will read them to our panelists when the time is appropriate. And please remain muted unless you were um, speaking. So I'd like to introduce our speakers, Dr. Matthews Parrett and his Associate Professor of Plant Pathology at the NFRAC Quincy. Dr. Parrett has been with the NFRAC Quincy since 2010. His primary research focuses on the etiology and epidemiology of plant diseases, of vegetables, ornamental crops, and the development of integrated pest management strategies for diseases of economic relevance, <clears throat> as well as the detection and characterization of plant pathogens. Dr. Parrott will introduce our facility and farm crews and then discuss our specialty crops, research and extension activities. Dr. Cheryl Makoviak is an associate professor in soil and water sciences also at the NFRAC Quincy. Dr. Makoviak has been at Quincy since 2004 and her research addresses nutrient cycling and water quality in agroecological systems with an emphasis on forage-based production systems and highly weathered soils. She has 70% research and 30% extension responsibilities. Dr. Makoviak will provide a short overview of ongoing NFRAC research and extension activities related to sustainable agriculture, which includes row crops, forestry, and natural resources. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Dr. Parrett, who will begin our presentation. Kelly, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for a very nice introduction. Um, uh, our goal for today would be to kind of give an overview. And first, I would like to uh, start with our administration. Uh, currently, our interim director is Dr. Barry Tillman, and we have a large group of uh, dedicated administrative staff uh, working to support our systems and our programs. And I just wanted to highlight all of the staff in the top tier right here uh, who uh, do this process and support system for all of the faculty members here. I also would like to acknowledge uh, that we have a significant uh, group of people who do a tremendous amount of work in the farm and the facilities management, uh, from the farm manager to the facilities key managers, and also many individuals within certain programs as well as within the farm who do an outstanding job that makes us all uh, look good at all the different aspects we do. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank all of them for the wonderful service they do. In addition to the 
uh, staff at Quincy, I would like to also acknowledge the fact that we are three locations in one. And I would like to acknowledge the fact that the administrative farm and facilities and scientists at NFRC Mariana and Live Oak also are key integral parts of this uh, structure. And uh, due to lack of time, I would not be going into detail, but thank you very much uh, for all what you do. In case of specialty crops, which I'll be focusing on, uh, we are four faculty members uh, who lead the program from a production standpoint. So that's Dr. Gary Knox in environmental horticulture, who deals with ornamental crops significantly. Dr. Josh Freeman, uh, specifically working on vegetable crops. We are in the process of hiring a fruit and nut stress physiologist in a horticulture department. We also have Bob Hawkmuth, who is a vegetable horticulturist, also a regional specialized agent, also serving as the associate director of NFREC Live Oak. Supporting these programs are Dr. Xavier Martini, an entomologist working with all of us, and myself in plant pathology working with this group. I should mention very importantly that many of our programs will not be successful without the tremendous support of all of these individuals that you see to the right, who are key scientists that make our programs work and the NFRC programs work very well. Just to give an introduction and a problem statement on what are the key emphasis for the specialty crops group at NFREC. We directly engage with North Florida producers and because we are in the tri-state area, we also engage with many producers with Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi also. We have roughly watermelon and cucurbits in about 8,500 acres, carrots in about 4,500 acres, tomatoes in about 3,000 acres, peppers and cabbage in about 500 acres, and many other which, minor vegetable crops. Citrus, for example, cold hardy citrus is a significantly increasing acreage in North Florida with an estimated approximate 1,000 acres in production. We do have a significant woody ornamentals, uh, nurseries, and landscapers who work on these systems, including many crops like roses, crepe myrtle, hydrangea, and many other. In addition, turf, ornamental perennial peanut, many other minor crops are also very important in production. If we were to take this in a nutshell, we are thinking about 18,000 plus acres of annual production by producers that we uh, work with, we engage with, we support their production system. Uh, this is just to showcase what uh, is the big picture here. Now, the important constraint for this protection is emerging, re-emerging, and persistent pest weeds and diseases, which continues to be a major problem. We are looking at systems level programs that integrate approaches that are critical for effective management of these issues. I just want to show you a glimpse of some of the key programs that we have that we do collectively as a group. One of the first things that I want to show you is the key impact that white flies and thrips make to production systems in North Florida. If you think about white flies and thrips, uh, the, it is not just insects out there, but they carry many critical viruses. And if I were to give some examples, in case of cucurbits, as you see here, this is cucurbit chlorotigellose virus, which is yet another new virus that's discovered in North Florida and also in South Florida and which can also cause fruit quality issues. And this is not just the one virus that causes it, it always is in a mix of multiple viruses. Similarly, tomato yellow leaf pearl virus continues to be a major problem with a lot of work that we are doing currently and with a lot of work that we are in the process of doing, we feel like we would be in a good state to do an effective approach development that will support producers. Similarly, tomato spotted wilt virus, while not as significant like previous years, it still continues to be present and there is a lot of work going on. This team includes Xavier Martini, myself, Freeman, Hawkmuth, Pam Roberts from Southwest Florida REC, Jeffrey Meru, breeder from TREC in Homestead, Sam Hutton from GCREC, and many University of Georgia faculty members. And I just want to show you a glimpse of the different kind of things we do. For example, varietal resistance is key. And here, what you're seeing is tomato yellow leaf curl resistant variety to the three rows that you see, and many of the other varieties are non-resistant. So Josh Freeman annually does a lot of variety trials to screen for resistance in UF bred varieties, as well as varieties that are brought by many industry partners. 
Another key important in this full structure is the ability to diagnose pathogens at the field scale. In our labs, we do develop many isothermal methods. These are methods that can detect RNA or DNA of pathogens rapidly in the field within 20 minutes. For example, below are two pictures which shows single detection of a virus and multiple viruses detected within 20 minutes in a single run. Also, a significant part of our group is work on chemical ecology that Xavier Martini is leading. A lot of work on visual and olfactory senses and how the insects as well as predators would uh, behave in response to that is a key aspect of his program. One of the things that I would like to highlight from Xavier's program is work on clay particles integrated with uh, active ingredient in many plant essential oils, limonene. And this is being currently tested on on-farm trials, as you see here on tomatoes in North Florida. In addition, we do a lot of work on clay particles as a group, myself and Josh Freeman and Bob Hawk both involved in this program, trying to look at ability of these particles to prevent or reduce white fly feeding and potentially reduce virus incidence. Xavier Martini also does a lot of work on push-pull system in this particular case on thrips management. Just shifting gears a little bit, one of the key aspects that our programs also focus on is to invest research and extension efforts on key aspects pertaining to alternatives to methyl bromide. For example, work done by Josh Freeman and colleagues at University of Georgia shows that you could, you, you could use uh, plastic mulching technology, in this, in this case, using a TIF mulch, which is a uh, much better mulch, totally impermeable, impermeable mulch, in addition with fumigants can reduce the fumigant rates to one by third in case of dimethyl disulfide, as you see in the foreground right. To the compare, uh, the control is on the foreground left. In another project, for example, Gary Knox and a group of uh, faculty members within main campus, uh, including Adam Dale, FDAX, and many other partners, work towards surveillance of crepe myrtle bar scale and also looking at ways to manage them, which includes cultural control practices, use of predators, as well as chemical control approaches, uh, which are very critical for managing this. I should make a point that this is not just a pest of crepe myrtle. It can also affect many other uh, plant species to a lesser degree, but it continues to be a problem. Moving on to from that, I just want to highlight that our group does a lot of work on bacterial disease management. And as you would know, one of the important and the most critical pathogens out there pertaining to management and the disease would be citrus greening. And Asian citrus psyllid is a critical vector that's important from the perspective for North Florida cold hardy citrus production. Surveillance of Asian citrus psyllid in annually and routinely is an extremely critical aspect to look at where psyllids are present in the panhandle, in the coast and further north, and also potential invasion of citrus screening disease into these areas where there's more and more new production is coming up. And Xavier Martini and group is significantly working in this area with support from our labs pertaining to diagnostics of the pathogen. Another important aspect to think about is that vegetable crops produced in North Florida uh, are affected by many bacterial diseases, in this case for watermelon, tomatoes, peppers, and copper, one of the key bactericides used in these systems uh, are getting, at, are not as effective anymore because of the development of copper tolerance strains. What we are trying to do is develop many type of new systems, including copper composites, as you see in this scanning electron micrographs. We have worked on magnesium-based materials like magnesium oxide, which could significantly reduce the total load of copper that goes into the environment, as well as works against copper tolerance strains. I would like to bring perspective on rose rosette disease, which is caused by rose rosette imara virus and vectored by this aerophyte mite named Phylocoptis fructifilus. Xavier Martini, myself, Gary Knox, and many national partners work towards a program that looks at developing many components that would be critical in protecting Florida's rose industry. I just want to mention to you that Florida is the largest shrub rose producer in the country, which some of you may not know. The key aspect in this process is developing diagnostic techniques and 
we have developed a series of diagnostic techniques, but most importantly, we have developed a battery powered diagnostic system where you can run this in the field scale uh, within 20 minutes to test whether these plants are a positive for the virus. Similarly, the group have worked towards surveillance of the mite in Florida, and which led to the discovery of the mite uh, in, in North Florida. And continued surveillance is in progress, where Xavier Martini and group is working to expand on this work. Also key to his work is looking at volatiles and predatory mite preferences to volatiles, uh, like in case of this um, Ambulaceous Swiss key. And we are trying to see whether this could be potential good and predator for aerophyte mite, the vector for the virus. We are also looking into plant defense inducers like acibens or s, s methyl We have done many studies. We are expanding on these studies and integration of these systems to see how well this could perform in protecting Florida's rose industry. I would like to just give a perspective on the seeded program that UFIFS have funded. There's 19 projects right now active. Uh, throughout the state. And I just want to give you a perspective that eight of these projects, NFREC faculty members in, are involved from a research and extension perspective. I also would like to highlight the fact that uh, Josh Freeman, uh, in collaboration with SAC Brim and many others are working on an industrial hemp project with the key goal of looking at total potential THC, uh, which is having a threshold of 0.35 percentage in many varieties. What he's finding is that there are varietal differences, but research clearly indicates that there is still, there is a clear aspect where the hemp to break that THC potential, THC threshold uh, rapidly within a very short uh, uh, weeks after antithesis. This is an ongoing work. And to finish up, one of the key areas that we also invest in is to look at non-invasive ornamentals and ornamentals that benefit pollinators. This work is a collaborative effort between Gary Knox, Xavier Martini, um, uh, Deng at GCREC and Wilson and Malinga in environmental hot. And this includes a lot of work that includes the UF bred sterile lantana species. And I would like to highlight the very fact that Gary Knox and team, especially working with a Gardening Friends of Big Bend, a nonprofit volunteer support group, was able to develop a botanical garden at NFREC with the primary goal of plant evaluation uh, as you would uh, potentially have it in your landscape. This is a very good example of how we are trying to engage local groups also uh, at our, in our work. I just want to highlight a diversity of extension activities we do. We do a lot of on-farm uh, demonstrations. We do a lot of greenhouse demonstrations when we're dealing with quarantine issues. We're dealing, looking at demonstrations on industrial hemp. This is a work done on ambrosia beetle where trunk, trunk injection uh, is being conducted by Xavier Martini and grew up. You will see Bok Pokmut doing work and demonstrating um, BMP rated aspects uh, in watermelon production. You will see that we are very much engaged with public on field days as well as participating actively and showing the value of the scientific aspects we do to public. In, in this case, in Tallahassee Science Festival, we still engage with producers one-on-one -on -one also. On top of that, we also still do all the traditional methods, including lectures and other aspects. We work on many EDIS articles. We publish many EDIS articles to provide up-to-date information to producers. We also contribute significantly in many production manuals including the Vegetable Production Handbook for Florida and the Florida Citrus Manual. With that, the final slide I would like to also mention that we have a significant stakeholders that we serve. As some, we just uh, assist them in the work we do and the work to help them to be successful. But many of these stakeholders are also key partners. I'm just listing a partial list of some of the key players that we work with. There's all the, all the producers that you see in the left. There's all the key industry partners that we work with. These are the key partners pertaining to grower associations and other programs that we work with. I would like to very much highlight the fact that we work with University of Florida Extension Agents significantly because that relationship and that network is, makes us very strong in, the how we, in how we operate. With that, I will wrap up and I will pass to Cheryl Makowiak for continuing the presentation.
Good afternoon. I had myself muted. Can you all see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so it's Matthew Zanzuan's great job. Um, one thing I want to bring out is that although we've broken it up the way we have today, plenty of the faculty in the group that Matthews was talking about interacts with the groups that I'm going to talk about. They have pathologists and entomologists, and even the horticulturists, and, and we uh, interchange ourselves with whatever problems and uh, research is going on. So don't, don't think that we're all in our own compartments here. But um, I've been tasked today with uh, talking about three big areas, and that's agronomy in terms of row crop systems, uh, forestry, and natural resources. And, and so what I want to do is a little bit different take instead of getting into uh, highlighting specific um, detailed research. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show how all of these in broad uh, areas are integrated together and how it really takes a full community. And that's what makes NFRAC unique in terms of great diversity in discipline uh, being represented and, um, and the types of work we're doing, but also that hope, focus on the areas where we have concerns here in North Florida and beyond. So as you can see in the first slide, um, as I mentioned, the three major areas, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and look a little more at what we've got here. There we go. Um, the De Quincy team is, um, we've got representation from agronomy quite a bit from Dr. Blunt and Dr. Wright. Uh, Blunt works on the uh, forage breeding and, and Dr. Wright does row crops. Uh, Dr. Ian Small, plant pathology, also works quite a bit with the row crops. Dr. Pat Minogue is in forest resources and conservation. And so he's doing the, the yeoman's work of trying to keep our forest systems together in, in North Florida, especially after Hurricane Michael, that's quite a task working with a lot of those producers who've lost most all of their, um, their income. Dr. Uh, uh, Sunny Liao is in water and soil sciences as I am, and uh, she focuses on uh, soil micro biology, and, and I focus more on soil, um, chemical, nutrient cycling, and water quality. We also have a couple of research assistants, Dr. Ramdio Sipal and, and Dr. Siju Sudeep, and they focus on the, agron on the agronomic portions of our research. Again, as Matthews has shown, we have a large scientific staff at Quincy and quite a few doctors, PhD level, um, who support us. And again, they are our infrastructure. They're the ones that keep everything from falling apart. And, and because we do so much work interchanging with the location in Mariana, which is about 45 minutes west of us uh, as part of the NFREC, they, they're where the livestock is and also additional row crop research. And we all do a lot of commuting back and forth. So um, even though we're separate, um, Entities, in some respects, we, we really work as one team. We've got Dr. Barry Tillman in agronomy um, that works with the peanut and Ohio Lalic uh, peanut varieties. Dr. Jose Dubé, who, for, who works on forage management. Dr. Nicholas De Lorenzo um, is animal science and animal nutrition in cattle. And Dr. Angela Gonella Diaz, also in animal sciences and looking at reproduction. Again, they have a research assistant, Dr. Lisa Garcia Jimenez, who really helps keep their team together in terms of um, she got her PhD recently in uh, grazing management systems, but also look at pollinators and other things. So she's working with Dr. Um, Martini as, um, as well. And so, um, again, a large team. And they have their own sta scientific staff um, that you can see there. And um, so we didn't want to leave those folks out. Again, we also work at Live Oak and, and have interactions with the row crop systems. And, and so they play an important role as well. Again, we have many students, staff, visiting scientists, et cetera. Um, don't hold me to the exact numbers here, but roughly you know, five postdocs, um, 17 or so graduate students. And besides the numbers, we have a large number. We also have a fair amount of diversity representing various countries across the, the uh, world. Okay, so this is gonna be a, like a little tour and I'm gonna give you um, just a taste of the kinds of things we're doing. Uh, I just, I list the 
faculty team players. Um, but again, it makes up a lot more than just what you have. I have listed here. And if there are any of these areas that you find you want to learn more about, you can contact any of those names there, or you can contact me, and I'll get you to the right sources to, to learn more. But I, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. I just want to show how all this comes together and why it's important to have this diversity at this location. Okay, so the first is, and a lot of you are probably familiar with the side-based crop rotation. And when we look at agron agronomic systems in Florida, we have oh, approximately 50,000 um, farm operations in the state covering nearly 10 million acres. And uh, most of our row crop tends to be in the north part of the state. So it's really an important part. Again, we cover both temperate and subtropical. So that makes it key that we can cover both of those um, types of clients or stakeholders. And when we talk about row crop systems, of course, we know we need to rotate our crops. We should use conservation tillage. But beyond that, we can improve our soils even more by adding one more layer, and that is a sod for a period of time. In this case, they've done research that finds in the past 20 years. Two years is kind of that Goldilocks uh, area where we gain those benefits of having a, a, a sod forming grass and builds up that soil carbon, that biomass underground that really carries over into the following row crops. Also breaks pest and disease cycles by adding that additional um, diversity. So again, the little highlights, we're building soil organic matter, at least conserving it. And, you know, we'll never be like Iowa, right? Our soils, you know, they're not good here, right? So we, we do the best we can and we can make big impacts by just increasing a couple percentages in organic matter. We can increase water infiltration. And once it's in the ground, we can conserve that water because that organic matter helps hold the moisture. And that then um, results in less leaching. If we have less leaching, we will tend to lose less nutrients, in this case, primarily nitrates. Nitrates and nitrate pollution of our waterways is a, a big concern, especially in the north part of the state. And, and throughout the country, actually. And again, if we have this sod system for two years in our rotation, we can hay it, we can sod it, remove sod, but you really get the big impact is by grazing it. So putting livestock in that system. So you can see how all of this is just sort of a, a microcosm of uh, IFAS in general. We have a lot of representation of a lot of different disciplines there. Okay, and when you have big systems like that and you, and you want to have what are the newest technologies that are going to make it more efficient and, and more effective for our farmers. We've got in the top left, we have a various soil sampling unit. And so this actually maps the soils for us, uh, electrical conductivity, soil pH, and organic matter. And from that, we can have zones of better quality soils and lower quality soils. We can layer that with uh, Sergo soil maps and, and, and help us manage when we get to these variable rate management schemes. Um, it really makes it a more robust system and, and hopefully will be more economic as well. We've only got so much land, so we've got to make the most we can out of what we have. Uh, soil moisture sensors, you know, now we go and measure uh, simultaneously at different depths. We've got unmanned um, aerial vehicles or the old term drones to help us in mapping and scouting issues. Uh, soil sampling even has gotten uh, a little more high tech where you used to take a six inch soil sample with your soil probe. Um, we can have probes now that can go down 30 to 100 feet actually. And this is a geo probe, not to promote any one company, but we've found nitrate plumes down to 20 to 30 feet below the surface. So there's things that we learn in the subsoils, in the deep soils that we will not know if we're just focused on the surface soils. And again, we've got more uh, scouting technology in the bottom right there is, is some phenotypic um, uh, scouting equipment that you'll probably hear about in the next uh, presentation uh, in a couple weeks. Okay, so the second system is taking that side-based rotation system and now how can we also integrate crop livestock but on a short shorter duration because a lot of farmers are just like, well I cannot invest or they don't feel they can invest two years in a side but can I gain benefit if I do row crops and then follow that with a cover crop and graze that cover crop. 
there's concern, oh, you're going to put cattle in there. That's going to add to the potential pollution, nitrate losses, and, and that type of thing. So we're looking at that. We've got over 300 acres of crops that have very little, if any, winter cover on it. And if we can graze that cover, that really is a big economic impact because we can feed that animal, um, provide greater nutrition. Dr. Angela uh, Gonella Diazza is looking at heifer development. So high quality, some of our best quality forages are grown in the wintertime. Um, we're finding right now that if we do that system, we aren't increasing nitrate loss. In fact, it seems to help conserve that to some extent. If we're building those soils better in the wintertime, that benefit should carry over into our summer cash crop, uh, whatever row crop we are, are planning on growing. In this case, it was cotton. Again, we can look at uh, a couple of our um, commodities, specific, more, a little more specifically. In this case, we have carinata as a multi-purpose crop. So when we're looking at these crops, how much bang for the buck can we get? How much use can we get out of this crop? So we can use carinata as a winter cover. We can look at it primarily why people want to grow it is for uh, fuel and then have other co-products as well. So you can see at the bottom there, we've got the seed itself, which is key, high, high in oils and very high quality. And we can, we can create crude, diesel, even jet fuel, which is a very, very high quality fuel. Um, Eglin Air Force Base that's in the panhandle, I think was involved at some level. And at one time they were talking about in terms of the Air Force that the U.S. Air Force was going to replace about a third or le around 30 percent of their fuel with biofuels. And that was one of the key ones, one of the only ones that could really meet those standards. And then Dr. De Lorenzo has been working with the pelleted meal that can come as a byproduct from processing and feeding it to livestock and working it at that level. Then we take that and, and then look at, again, our conventional crops. How many other uses can we get from those? Dr. Tillman is well known for his peanut work as a breeder in the high oleic um, industry. And, but he's also worked with us in looking at annual peanut as, a, um, as an annual forage. And it can reseed itself to some extent for a couple of years. And it produces great forage that first year. And so there are some varieties that you don't have to put fungicides on and, and, and are tolerant. They don't produce a lot of peanut, but as a forage, they're pretty good. So he's been working with that some. And, and Dr. Ann Blunt, um, a lot of you know, has been working on bahia grass forever. And, but bahia grass itself, it's turf, pasture. And again, we can use it in crop rotations. And, you know, cool season, annuals, cover crops. 10 or so years ago, people weren't really into the cover crops. They were the real popular in the 70s, but well, they all came back. And most of those cover crops are forage crops. And so forage crops that have very short life cycles are especially popular for as a, just a general cover crop. Okay, shifting a little bit, alternatives. We have alternative forest crops as well. Dr. Pat Minow, he he's our one forester here at the center and he, he can't, holds a lot of, um, Juggles a lot of balls, wears a lot of hats. He's very good weed specialist as well. And um, he's helping in a 24, almost a $25 billion forestry industry in the state. And so besides the traditional BMPs and management of pine plantations, he's been looking at eucalyptus as a fiber and energy crop. Um, and even in tongue oil, some of you may have heard of tongue oil back at the turn of the century, folks were looking at that as a crop, the industry sort of fell apart because the genetics weren't that great. Now we've got new genetics from USDA and others, and China and other countries are really, really have a high demand for tongue oil. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent oil. I work with wood a little bit myself, and it's, it's one of the best oils you can use, and it's used for other industrial processes as well. And, and then again, going back more towards uh, ecology, looking at the longleaf pine ecosystem and restoration, you know, we've, we've really lost that ecosystem. It's one of the most diverse in the world. And uh, so he's been looking at that in terms of land prep, weed control, and, and production. Uh, these systems, we talk about grazing systems and, and conservation tillage and, and, and sod rotation. They do help reduce nutrient losses to the environment, but they're not perfect. And the, the best, one of the best systems to reduce those, those losses is 
in unfertilized forest systems. And so we can conserve soil water um, and, um, and nutrients. We've got products that come out of that. We, pr we provide wild wildlife habitat. Um, we're only 10 or so miles from the Apalachicola National Forest. We have the Torreya State Forest as well with some of the most rare uh, tree species in the world. It helps increase biodiversity. And because we have these beautiful systems, we can support agro-tourism. And that's one thing we haven't done enough of. I think we could do a lot more. So um, that's an exciting area. And so we've talked about commodities. And, and now let me look at it from an ecosystem service type of um, direction. Um, carbon sequestration. Everything I've talked about up to this point has some tie-in with carbon sequestration. And um, whether it's forest management, which is an excellent way to do that. We've still got to produce food and fiber, so we're going to have to do agriculture, right? And the systems we are using are some of the best for conserving and building soil um, carbon and organic matter. Even grazing management, having the right grazing management can go a long way. What, what's the composition of that pasture? What forages are going to help support that? Uh, soil health management. Remember, soil used to be called soil quality. Now it's called soil health because we've increased our emphasis on the soil biological health. Um, soil, when you think about fertility, it's physical fertility, chemical fertility, which I'm tied into those two, mostly in the chemical realm. And then soil biological fertility. And that's where Dr. Sunny Liao comes in. She's a soil microbial ecologist and looking at the soil microbiome. She looks at both the um, bacterial communities and fungal communities, really emphasizing fungal communities. There's some very interesting things coming out of that, that area of research. And, and just at the bottom right, you see an example where she's looking at the organomineral interactions and you know things such as carbon, other cations, divalent cations, and calcium and other things can actually help hold that carbon longer than it would otherwise. And so combining fertility and, and organic um, composition, how does that build our soils and maintain that soil health? As, as Matthew showed a whole giant list, I, I, I have to apologize. This list is very short, but that's not because we don't have as many groups. We have a lot more, but it was hard to get a lot of them put on the slide in time. Um, and there is some overlap. And again, I wanna reemphasize the county extension, not even just in Florida, and we have our group down in the bottom right, you see that's our uh, Northwest District of County Agents. Um, all of them have masters, some of them have PhDs, so very well trained. But we also work with uh, agents throughout the state and across state lines as well. So multi-state and, and it's a great group to work with. Um, and just a reminder that there's one more seminar or presentation in a couple of weeks, and that's the future NFREC. We'll have some of our newer um, faculty present there, and that's probably going to be the most exciting of all to listen to, so I, I hope you all join us then. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. Hopefully our participants have a better idea of the current priority areas of the NFREC and how we really come together to function as a whole, <clears throat> even though we have our distinct departments. So at this time, I'm going to launch a trivia poll. This is a, a, nice, a nice break um, before we start our Q&A. But while the poll is launched, if anyone has any questions for our panelists, including Dr. Knox, please type them in the chat box. <clears throat> okay. Does everyone, does anyone see the poll? I can see it. Okay. So I'm not sure if it's a question at a time or all five, but if you guys could just do your best to, to answer, choose the correct answer for each question, and then I will um, see your results and give you guys the correct answer. The first question uh, had to do, I think we talked about it at our, the last um, seminar that we had. See, lots of answers coming in. Josh wants to know what does he win? 
Just give it a couple more minutes. We have like 40% that have voted, so I'll just wait till we get to like 50 and then I'll go ahead and just share the answers with you all. All right. So number one was the, what was the first former name of the NFREC? That was the Tobacco Experiment Station. So 56% of you all that got that right. Uh, Florida 301 is a variety developed and released by Dr. Ron Barnett. What crop are we talking about? The answer was wheat. Okay, number three, Dr. Fred Rhodes was a blank. The soil chemist. Number four, which of the following NFRC faculty members is most closely related to the concept of semiochemicals? That was Dr. Xavier Martini. <clears throat> like most of you know your stuff. If you have heard the phrase sod based rotation, whose name would come to mind immediately? So Dr. McCoyak talked about this, but the name that would come to mind immediately was David Wright. Okay, great job, everyone. I'm going to go ahead, let me pull up my questions for our panelists. All right, to kick us off on the Q&A, I um, want to ask Dr. Parrett, if I were a newly enrolled graduate student with the liberty to choose from any of the 13 UF IFAS RECs to do my research, why, in your opinion, should I pick the NFREC? So uh, my answer would be that always pick NFREC. You know, that, that should be your first priority. You know, just kidding. I think the important thing to think about for a graduate student when they want to start is to see what they want to do in their life, what are their goals and objectives, what do they want to learn. No single REC or single unit can provide all the skills that are needed. I would say that NFREC do have a diverse uh, number of faculty as shown today, who have a great amount of diverse skills. However, when you think about what kind of diversity your program, your thesis or dissertation should have, you may want to think about how you could potentially also engage faculty from other RECs, from the departments, to see how their program would be more holistic, more uh, useful from the grand scheme of things. So I would say that the perspective could be that, what do you really want to do? What kind of crops you want to work on? If it is not crop related, what do you specifically want to work on? Would going to coming to Quincy, Mariana, or Live Oak, or would you be more uh, in, successful with your interests working in, let's say, in another REC, but having one of us as a committee member? So there are different ways you can structure it, and we see this all the time. And one more thing is that I, I would, any graduate student or prospective graduate student, what I would say is that uh, think about uh, advices in more than one REC. We would love to have you here, but at the same time, it would really help to bring the structure into a more fruitful way that you could use in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Knox, I have a two-part question for you. Um, what has been your th three favorite projects of your career? Um, and then 
The second part is how has your program evolved? Um, has the focus and relevance of interdisciplinary collaboration increased in recent decades relative to past decades? Dr. Knox? Hi, everyone. That's a, that's a complex question. I'll see if I can handle it all. Uh, in terms of some of the, the programs that I've been involved in that I, that I like the, the best over my career, I think uh, the, the team approach that we have to uh, uh, helping stakeholders with new and emerging diseases and pests, I think that's an, a great example of how we're perfectly positioned here at NFREC to do that. And that has uh, enormously helped the, uh, the uh, green in industry, the nursery and landscape industry, and working with uh, Matthews Parrott and Xavier Martini and Russ Mizell and, and other folks over the years. Um, beyond that, uh, another multidisciplinary program I was involved in is uh, the program now known as Florida Yards and Neighborhoods. Uh, that started off in the late 80s and 90s. We were the first multidisciplinary extension team, and we created the first systems approach to dealing with a problem. And in this case, it was urban horticulture and some of the environmental issues that urban horticulture can cause, with Florida Yards and Neighborhoods being a great example to, to solve that. We got millions of dollars in grants to expand and develop the program, and it's now embedded in virtually every county in Florida with other examples in other states across the U.S. Uh, and, you know, programs tend to ebb and flow and come and go, and, and so I, I found that my career has really made changes every eight to ten years to deal with new issues or new opportunities or with uh, areas that, that our expertise here can particularly deal with. I think I'll okay, end there. Thank you. Okay, I think the only question we've had in our chat box, Dr. Mokoviak answered um, through the chat box, but if anyone has any other ones, but otherwise I do have a question for Dr. Mokoviak too. It's another two-part question. Um, in an age where, when there's information overload and almost any information can be obtained at the click of a button, uh, what is the role of NFREC scientists to help filter that information from the noise? Um, and the second part, which I can repeat again uh, later, but that is how can they make this filter knowledge available to stakeholders in a relevant and timely fashion? Okay. <laughs> Being an older faculty, I'm probably not as good to answer this as, as some of the, the younger folk. But um, first of all, we need to be... Uh, uh, aware of what's going on, stay up to date, what, what is being said out there, what's going on out there. But I think the key part is having a good relationship with our county extension agents, because the, it's the agents that have the most direct interaction with our stakeholders or producers and, and the public in general. Um, we have 4-H agents, we have, you know, agents in every specialty that we represent. And so making sure they are uh, well tooled with the information so that they can uh, cut through some of the um, nonsense that tends to get out there um, or, or, you know, help direct them into where some of the more uh, pertinent research is. Again, social media is such a big thing right now. I do not Twitter, but when I was working on some of the slide sets, I, I noticed at least half of our faculty are Twittering and doing other things. So, there is some of that general information coming out, but in terms of any of the technical details, I think going through the agents and promoting our agents and training our agents is one of the key ways of doing that. Um, let's see, timely fashion, again, getting on social media is the, the easiest and fastest way to get that out there, I think. And, and I open it up to anyone else that has. It's a great general question for, I think, everybody, if anyone else wants to jump in on this. Yeah, Ted in the chat said tweeting. Yeah. Tweets, social media, which you kind of touched on. Great. Does anyone else have anything to add to that question? I would add to Cheryl's point there is that the most important thing I also see, and I think Cheryl you know, kind of made that point in a different way also, is that I think we need to think about the quality of the information. And a lot of the time, so for example, EDIS documents, um, do we just create it for a number? No, I think the key aspect will be that we engage in quality information, we engage in most up-to-date information, and the more and more we do, 
engaging with, as you said, you know, UFIFIS extension agents very much because they're going to be very key to seeing what's happening in real time uh, at different places. So ability for us to uh, understand what is the most up-to-date information and also engaging with colleagues at, uh, within UF and maybe outside UF. Uh, the best information and the best resources we could get from sources beyond us is going to be extremely important. It's not just going to be about us. It's about the best information that we could get from any good reputed sources. And this could be other land grant universities. This could be state and federal agencies. This could be industries, um, you know, many companies that may have useful information essentially think about the perspective. This could be non-governmental organizations. This could be small groups. Uh, think about everyone in the picture. Think about the most high quality information rather than high quantity information. And uh, that's probably one way we could look at it. All right, well, it was our goal.